My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. I'll be one of my friends. I'm just trying to save you a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to really put it in context, because days like today need that. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Look, th- this market's so ridiculous. You can knock it over with a feather or take it up with a breeze. I wanted to borrow from Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. But the simple fact is that this isn't the worst of times. Just the worst of times for the stocks in certain industries and the best of times for others. All within the confines of some hideous action for the average, without sinking 626 points, S&P plunging 2.12%, and the Nasdaq pummeling, plummeting 3.26%. This nasty old day right into the close. Now, what makes this market so ridiculous, my eyes? Look, we had some obscure purchasing manager report that shows some stuff this morning, causing a wholesale collapse of the cyclicals, along with the home builders and anything connected to technology, particularly the once beloved data center plays with big AI exposure. Given the chaos after that manufacturing PMI number, you think the semiconductor oil and housing worlds were in free fall. But in reality, these companies are doing incredibly well. The sellers are just worried that they won't stay good for long. Frankly, I think this action represents pure stupidity. And the fact that the market is typically challenged in September, that's what's going on to me. Something that's true empirically. Well, to the point where it can become self-fulfilling. That's the way it felt like for me today. Sure, the economy's slowing. But in a few weeks, the Fed's going to cut interest rates. And you'll wish you'd stuck with a lot of what was for sale today, like the home builders. I like D.R. Horton and Lennar, both of which reported amazing quarters. They're the real winners in any move that would take down mortgage rates. That's what would happen if the Fed cut. As far as the data center, look, there was an excellent piece by the always iconoclastic and ironic Michael Semblis over J.P. Morgan. He posits that we could be in one of the mo- those moments where the spending for AI rivals the extreme spending we saw during the 90s to fund the Internet build-out. <laughs> Eventually, their Internet dreams came true, but not fast enough to save most of those companies. A repeat of 1999 would indeed be devastating for NVIDIA and all the techs that surround it. As much as I think Semblis is the best pure strategist on Wall Street, the best, I found this piece a little harsh because we had many fly-by-night outfits spending like drunken sailors back in the 1990s. Now, though, NVIDIA and its clients are some of the most well-endowed companies ever. NVIDIA doesn't have any real competition, and no one is near them by their own proclamations. As for the hyperscaler spenders, as I see it, the race for the best AI that they find themselves in is about more than just bragging rights. The key to the next level of thought, to the next level of inference, uh, is to spend a lot right now. These companies can afford they can afford to spend it. Again, I like the Internet fiber build out in the 90s. These tech titans are filled with great minds, and they're run by tight-fisted executives who sincerely want to spend as little as possible. They just can't. They just can't afford to. As NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wong has pointed out many times, if the tech titans don't spend, they're out of luck when some great use cases come along, and they don't have the infrastructure for it. Remember, Jensen has proselytized that the platform pays for itself very quickly. That sure wasn't the case back in 1999, was it? Of course, NVIDIA stock has become a total pariah right now after its amazing quarter because the world suddenly seems convinced that AI spending will peak soon, at which point it's all about the shouting. Stock's getting slammed because most investors think NVIDIA's run-up was too extreme. Given that the company only reported a major upside surprise, not the kind of insanely huge upside surprise they'd come to expect. The sellers are eager to take NVIDIA back to where it's trading during the last visit to the Charnel House in the first week of August. The stock ticked as low as $90 and change. I'm sure the sellers will be right back tomorrow morning after we learn tonight that the Justice Department hit NVIDIA with a subpoena over an antitrust probe. Now, who cares? That's the standard practice. It's shoot first and, sh- and second and third, though, with NVIDIA right now. No one's thinking, well, wait a second. Did it, why didn't the Justice Department just ask him some questions? No, it's done through subpoena with this administration. Now, nobody can put a price on the darn thing that is NVIDIA because there's a growing consensus that it's all too good to be true. They think the whole AI vision is led by Nevada. No, NVIDIA is too positive to believe. They don't believe it. It's kind of like the Emerald City and the Wizard of Oz. Come to think of it, I kind of feel like this has devolved into the cowardly lion situation, you know, where the stock just seems too dangerous for a professional investor to walk into. To borrow his best lines, all right, I'll go into NVIDIA for Jensen Wong. Wicked witch or no wicked witch, guards or no guards, I'll tear them apart. I may not come out alive, but I am going in there. There's only one thing I want you fellas to do. Talk me out of it. To me, this whole decline, which, again, I have said is not done, 
will end up being too extreme. The situation isn't as bad as we think when it comes to all of AI tech. At the same time, the people who bought the consumer packaged goods stocks, hand or fist, which has happened all session, betting on a recession, I think they've already gotten ahead of themselves more than that in a moment. Let me give you an example of what was confusing today about the extreme selling we saw in all of tech. Uh, Apple. Now, Apple isn't spending a boatload on AI. I thought, therefore, it should be going higher. Apple's basically borrowing its chat type AI from OpenAI which is partners with Microsoft. And it doesn't have to spend a dime. Makes no sense for it to get hit by all the AI spending worries, right? They're a beneficiary. Yet Apple stock was down 2.7% today because the selling in tech spared no one. Now you could say, well, well, thank heavens, it's at least not the oils, which trade like we've already electrified half the auto market and fossil fuels from the way out. Of course, the opposite is true. Demand for EVs is growing much slower than anybody expected. We have an oil company on to, uh, tonight. I think you'll hear good things. Like with tech, I think the extreme declines in the oils are unwarranted. But what I, what I think, frankly, doesn't matter right now. Unlike tech or even the housing stocks, oil is simply too hard to own. We own what I think is the best one for the Chapel Trust, Coterra. And I'm just thanking my lucky stars that we're only long one name in the space. The group's simply dreadful. Oh, and you can expect the oils to break down even worse if somehow peace breaks out between Israel and Hamas. Not that I bet on that. But how about those consumer packaged goods stocks that held up so well in the best of times tradition? They had radical rallies in unison, even as some are doing so much better than others. Let me, uh, let me play it in my own week suit. We own Procter & Gamble for the Chapel Trust. It's been a real pain in the butt, frankly. It creeps up the ladder of the rotation and then slides down the chute of earnings over and over again. It fell apart if the last quarter uh, plummeted from uh, 169 to 160. A couple sessions. The culprit was China, which took everyone by surprise. But ever since we got surety on the Fed's next move, Procter's been rallying like crazy. And today it jumped to a new high of 175. Did Procter's China problem get cured? I sure hope so. Or the moment we get some strong data, perhaps from this Friday's employment report, the shoots will be back, the ladder's pulled, and Procter stock will be headed lower again. How silly is all this? Well, Campbell Soup reported last week, and I kind of liked the quarter because of the stack business and the Rayo's acquisition looking real good, but the street couldn't stand it, so the stock got just, it, it got annihilated. Today, the darn thing shot up more than 3% to a 52-week high. In fact, all sorts of consumer stocks hit all-time highs. They had Colgate, Coca-Cola, and then the recession-resistant Walmart just arriving nonchalantly on that list because of their ability to weather a recession that's not coming. Then there was a whole other battalion of dividend stocks that joined the all-time high list by virtue of their having better than 3.5% yields. Do they all deserve the trade-up? Of course not. Their stocks are just part of a program that lumps them all together so hedge funds can get exposure to the group in order to play the economic weakness trade. The rotation can last another day or two. Uh, But then you have to worry about downgrades of these consumer stocks because they've run too much versus the fundamentals. Here's the bottom line. In the end, we have a market that's of two minds. If it takes economic activity at all, forget about it. If you do it as a matter of course, brush your teeth, wear deodorant, I hope, pay your electric bill, it's headed to all-time highs. Stupid? You bet it is. Comical? Totally. Unless you own tech and don't own the necessities, in which case your portfolio is in no position to laugh at anything. Let's go to Ryan in North Carolina. Ryan. Jim, thanks for taking my call. Uh, of first course, time, Ryan. long time investing club and all that. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. You know, you taught me the fundamentals. Um, it's allowed me to leave my, my job in the last year, and I have wow. the freedom and confidence. Um, life's too short to invest in a tobacco company, and with two little boys, my time was precious. You bet. And I'm thrilled that you made the move, and let's see if we can't work together to get some more, uh, make some more money. Yeah, man. Okay, so my problem is with Disney, and this is important. It's the company and the content, not the stock. Someone at Disney right now is probably even saying this guy doesn't fully recognize the value of our content. So please let me explain. There have been only two and a half movies in the last 10 years that fit a very significant but widely underserved demographic in young boys. My boys watch Moana, Inside Out, Encanto, Ryan the Last Dragon, Fancy Nancy, Frozen, Frozen 2, Encanto 2. What a, you know, all of this is great content. But, and it's a big but, all of this content has female protagonists. Coming-of-age stories, which are highly relatable among young boys, there's been two and a half. Luca, Coco, and Onward. Onward wasn't boys. Well, Ryan, I mean, here's the problem. 
I, I, yeah, look, I'm not going to disagree or agree on content. What I would tell you is, is I think the street does not recognize the value of the whole library, okay? And they don't recognize the value that ESPN actually has. They don't recognize that the theme parks are just magnificent gems, and they're focused on the labor problems. They're focused on some of the issues you just mentioned. They're focused on what I think are important zeitgeist issues, but are missing the point of the premium property that is Disney, which is why, as you know, we own it for the Child Trust and why Jeff Marks and I discussed buying some more here, because it is so low. That said, we ha- if, if Dis- Disney has to find the right CEO, and once they do and a vision is, is really cleared up, then what's going to happen is people say, why didn't I buy Disney in the 80s? What was I thinking? All right, look. Despite today's action, we're not in the worst of times right now. It's simply the worst of times for certain stocks, certain industries, even if there isn't a ton of evidence to back up the declines we're seeing, other than the fact that the stocks have gone up a lot. Wow, that's a reason. Guilty. Man, money tonight. Last year, we covered Sphere Entertainment. The stock is up about 40% since we took a look and didn't recommend it. So maybe it's time to take some profits in the name, or maybe it still has more room to run. I'm updating my thesis. Then last week was all about NVIDIA, but do you know the Dell reported a solid quarter, which flew under the radar? I'm covering the report and sharing it now. And maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to take a second look at the stock as it's plummeting. And Vista Energy has spent the better part of four years chugging higher. But with a questionable oil and gas backdrop, plus a company that has big asset in Argentina, where does the story stand now? I'm getting to the bottom of it with the CEO. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. I'm always searching for cool investment ideas that really resonate. But sometimes I'm too cautious when I drill down into the fundamentals, and I end up missing a great move. Take Sphere Entertainment, the operator of the world-famous Sphere in Las Vegas, the venue that can turn its exterior into just about anything, making it a terrific advertising space and a very interesting piece of skyline. I was intrigued by the story when it debuted last summer, but despite all of the buzz, I was skeptical about the growth story here as the future felt too uncertain, kind of like drafting Jamar Chase for your fantasy team this year. Specifically, I was worried about their ability to expand beyond Vegas, because while Vegas already has a bizarre skyline, many cities would be reluctant to allow something like this, a big sphere covered in LED lights that can transform into literally anything. Since then, though, the stock has rallied over 36%. In fact, a little over a month after I refused to stick my neck out on Sphere, the company reported a spectacular quarter with a surprise profit in its first full quarter of operations. House of pleasure. Much of its success came down to high demand for concerts at their one location, although there was also a ton of demand for the Sphere experience which includes things like the holographic art installations and chatting with robots, followed by a 50-minute multi-sensory short film postcard from Earth shown on the world's largest high-def screen. At the time, I had no idea if the strong demand would last or if Sphere would prove to be uh, the latest in a long line of Vegas novelties that eventually get old. I mean, things you check off on the bucket list, then you never do again, like the gondola in Venetian. Uh, but who wants to take a romantic ride in the middle of a shopping mall? I did, but I felt like a total dope, given that I'd recently been to Venice and experienced the real thing. Now, though, with more than three full quarters of operations under its belt, Sphere Experience is still putting up $1 million in average daily ticket sales, which is really terrific. Plus, the Sphere itself has turned out to be an unexpectedly versatile in terms of the kind of entertainment it can provide. See, it's not just concerts. Back in June, the company had its first keynote event, hosting Hewlett Packard Enterprise for their Discover 2024 showcase. This was followed by the NHL Draft, which was the Sphere's first live televised event. And now there's much more exciting stuff to come. Sphere is hosting UFC 306 next Saturday. Ten fights, two of them for championship belts. Now, personally, hockey's enough of a blood sport for me, but there's no denying that UFC has huge international appeal and, of course, appeal in this country. And if the usual star-studded crowd is in attendance, I think it's going to make for quite the spectacle. It'll be something people want to do when they're in Vegas. Of course, the success of the Sphere experience 
means the company doesn't need to take on these big alternative events unless their clients pay an arm and a leg. They make a million a day in ticket sales for doing nothing special. So you better believe they're making a killing from these events. On the last conference call, CEO and also New York Knicks owner James Dolan noted that some companies have been, quote, a little shocked with the price tag because they're actually competing with postcard from Earth, end quote. This disappointment for corporate event planners should be a music to the ears of sphere shareholders. But the main attraction here remains the concerts. When I covered this story last December, I was hearing rave reviews from the U2 residency. Since then, bands like Fish, uh, Dead & Company have enjoyed successful runs at the venue. Dead & Company even though it even extended their run due to high demand, mirroring what we saw with U2. Looking ahead, the Eagles, L.A., not Philadelphia, are beginning their run at the Sphere later this month as a residency that has already been extended multiple times due to high demand. Unlike Jeff Bridges and the Big Lebowski, a lot of people love the Eagles. Going forward, Sphere's planning its first ever electronic dance music act, uh, and that's uh, Anima. I knew it. Why do I struggle with that? Anima. Starting around New Year's. And the music isn't limited to live concerts. They recently announced a U2 immersive concert f- film that's uniquely made for their venue. Basically, they're going to do simulated reruns of previous shows that you might have missed. But remember, people go to Vegas, they, you know, they go once. They want to catch anything that has already happened. They'll go. Now, I never had much doubt about the strength of the sphere in Las Vegas. What worried me was whether the company could expand to additional cities. That's the fly here. As of right now, there's still no agreement for any new Sphere locations, despite the promise of updates coming soon from management on the last three conference calls. But that's the whole ballgame here. Without new locations, they don't really have a long-term growth story. The analysts are split on this issue. Last month, J.P. Morgan upgraded Sphere, said its international expansion is, quote, a matter of when, not if. On the other hand, Benchmark downgraded the stock today because they're feeling more dubious about the idea. Listen to this, quote, most communities are unlikely to welcome a massive glowing and sound emitting structure in their neighborhoods, end quote. Hey, they, look, that is my worry, too. Although we know the Sphere is working in Vegas, there are only a limited number of cities that can generate a similar level of consistent tourist traffic worldwide. Plus, Benchmark points out that since the original Sphere, quote, took five years and $2.3 billion to construct, rapid expansion seems impractical, end quote. Tough to argue with that, isn't it? Look, I don't doubt that Sphere's management honestly believes they could have an agreement for another location soon. But as management mentioned on the latest conference call, even though they can believe they even though they believe they can change the global entertainment landscape, quote, fully realizing that vision will take time, end quote. And how much time is really the question? It's a big question, though. Of course, there's one area where we got some clarity. Sphere subsidiary MSG Networks has an eight hundred and fifty million dollar term loan coming due Uh, in October, and they don't have enough cash for that. So they've hired advisors to try to refinance to a workout. If they can't come up with a deal, MSG Networks could go bankrupt. That's what we need clarity. But that's not actually a big deal for Sphere because this term loan is non-recourse to the parent. If they want, they can just let MSG burn. Now, while that might seem suboptimal to you, since Sphere wouldn't be on the hook, many analysts seem eager for them to get rid of MSG because then Sphere Entertainment would be a pure play on the thing that makes it most interesting, the Sphere. I've seen some analysts argue that MSG Networks is literally worth less than nothing to these guys. That's confusing. Putting it all together, Sphere Entertainment has done an incredible job with what they've got, which is one insane venue in Las Vegas. The company's certainly done better than I expected, which is why the stocks had such a big run. But the bottom line, in the end, I still have the same problems fear that I had back then. I just can't recommend the stock until we get some confirmation that they can actually build more of these things in commercially viable locations. There aren't that many of these on Earth who would know which ones would allow them to build something like this fear anywhere, anywhere near city limits. Now, pretty on aesthetic grounds, it's hard to imagine something like this fitting in anywhere else other than Vegas. Hey, maybe Macau? So Mia Culpa for under, underestimating Sphere Entertainment. But over the long haul, we still need some reassurance that there's a real appetite for more of these things. And we don't have it yet. And I don't know what's going to happen. Mad Money is back after the break. Coming up, dude, you're getting a recap. Kramer breaks down Dell's quarter next. Last week, all anyone could think about was the NVIDIA quarter, although it kind of dominated today's thinking, too. So some usually important earnings reports flew under the radar. In fact, the very next night, Thursday, we got some solid results from Dell to the point where I think the PC maker 
Well, I guess it's much more than that these days, though, has become an incredible bargain. During the earlier part of the AI boom, this stock was roaring. It rallied 90% last year, then climbed another 135% for the beginning of this year through late May. However, when summer came along, Dell sold off hard along with the rest of tech, especially anything AI related. At one point, it was down more than 50% from its highs, although by the time the company reported last week, it had recovered somewhat, down 38% from the high. So going into the quarter, the key question was simple. How bad could it be Could it be to possibly justify such an extreme sell-off? Of course, you could look at Dell's prior run and just say, easy come, easy go. But it's important to figure out if the underlying thesis remains intact. This story is all about Dell making servers for the data centers that power artificial intelligence, along with new lines of AI-infused PCs. Unfortunately, the numbers were somewhat confusing, but I think that Wall Street got this one right, at least initially, as the stock ultimately rallied more than 4% last Friday, before giving back all those gains today. Yep, Dell's still worth owning here, and I'm going to tell you why. Let's start with the numbers. Dell delivered a meaningful revenue beat, driven by 38% growth from its infrastructure solutions division. Wow, much better than expected. Mostly thanks to heavy investment in AI infrastructure by corporate clients. In fact, their server and networking sales were up 80% year over year. Dell's other business, the Client Solutions Group, which includes the PC business, came in a little light. But not light enough to offset the strength in the infrastructure side. In the earnings release, Dell Vice Chairman and COO Jeff Clark old hand, explained that, quote, our AI momentum accelerated in Q2, and we've seen an increase in the number of enterprise customers buying AI solutions each quarter. Notice the word solutions. I think that's really important. It's more than just a box. He added that AI optimized server demand jumped by 23 percent just versus the previous quarter. Now, last time Dell reported, some investors didn't like the margins from Dell's infrastructure business. Long story short, their earlier AI hardware sales mainly came from selling servers to large hyperscalers. And then here we're thinking about Alphabet, Amazon, Meta. And those companies can drive a hard bargain. Dell was confident that the margins would improve later on as they sold more networking and storage equipment along with services. Hardly anyone was willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, except me. Maybe that's because I saw that he was with Jensen, of course, Jensen Wong, CEO of NVIDIA, at the GTC conference I went to. Now, the stock jumped from 132 at the time I told you to stick with it in early June, all the way to 161 just over two weeks later. But if you didn't sell up there, you got steamrolled as it now pulled back to 111 thanks to the summer sell off. Well, it's actually just a little bit less. I don't know. It worries me that it's came down this much, but bear with me. I was right on the merits as Dell's infrastructure margins did indeed improve dramatically last quarter. Division's operating margin jumped from 8% in the first quarter to 11% in the second quarter. Wall Street was only looking for 10.7. Their original operating margin increased by 150 basis points. That plus but 712 million in share of purchase allowed Dell to deliver 19 cent earnings beat off a $1.70 basis. That all sounds pretty good, right? So why were people confused about the quarter then? To the point where the stock spent most of last Friday whipsawing around before it finally stabilized and rallied? Well, the main problem was management's guidance for the current quarter. Their revenue outlook was only in line, and their earnings outlook was for $2 plus or minus 10 cents. Analysts were looking for $2.19. Not ideal. More importantly, Dell indicated that they might see a sequential decline in AI sales versus the quarter they just reported. It's looking like the current quarter might be slower on that front. On the conference call, management explained, though, that their third quarter guidance assumes AI server sales will be down slightly, quarter over quarter, which really spooked people. But Dell also raised its full year forecast substantially, although they only raised their earnings forecast by 15 cents, which is de facto a guide down when you remember the company still reported a 19 cent earnings beat, 19 versus 50. Still, demand did accelerate, and unless this race card runs into a retaining wall, I think that process will continue. Now, ultimately, Dell's quarter was still well-received, with the stock rallying nicely on Friday before giving back much of that move in the, today's market by beatdown. I think the buyers won on Friday because Dell management did a great job of explaining what's happening on the AI front. Basically, they expect to slow down this quarter, not because of a lack of demand, but because they don't have enough supply to keep up with demand. Remember how everyone was wringing their hands because NVIDIA's new line of Blackwell chips, the fastest ones on Earth, ended up delayed a bit? Well, demand for servers powered by those chips is very much there. And Dell's really aligned with that. But Dell needs to figure out how quickly they can get the chips, then build the machines, and ship them to customers. That's why they're now projecting most of their Blackwell-related business to happen in the fourth quarter of, of 20, uh, and into 2025. Basically, it's a supply chain snag. So it's going to hit the current quarter, but only because it's delayed those sales to later in the year and into 2025. These were the guys who were really hurt by the, the Blackwell, well, some people say botched introduction. Ah. Now, with all this focus on the specific timing on AI server shipments, many other positives end up being ignored. 
Nobody seemed to care that Dell's infrastructure margins made huge progress, even though that was the big knock on the first quarter. At the same time, management said they expect their PC business to inflect higher in the, the uh, end of the year. Inflect higher, people were expecting lower. Very encouraging. In the end, there were mixed opinions on the Dell quarter because even though the company had great results, including their AI margins, we also got some noise regarding the, the specific timing of new AI server shipments in the back half of the year. But I think that those concerns are exactly that noise. Instead, we should be thinking about how Dell's also taking share from Supermicro. That's that SMCI. I told you that was troubled. Something doesn't get talked about enough. And that alone would lead you to think a bottom can't be all that far away from where we went out tonight. Bottom line. You need to stay focused on the secular trends that will ultimately determine the success of the company, not the quarter-to-quarter noise, the timing specifics that simply don't matter over the long haul. Dell stock has now come down to the point where it sells for four, around 14 times this year's earnings forecast, and it's trading at less than 12 times next year's analyst estimates. What? That doesn't mean you should buy it all at once right here. Remember, September tends to be a hideous month. But you've absolutely got my blessing to start a position for Dell, buying it gradually on any weakness in a pyramid stock. As it gets bigger, you, as it gets lower, you get bigger. Yeah, because the AI thesis, rocked as it was by today's trading, is still very much intact. All right, let's take some calls. Let's go to Arcady in New York. Arcady. Yes, sir. What's up? Now, Mike, I just want to tell you, you have great people that you that work for you, great staff members, really good Thank people. I, I got a question to ask you. I own Meta, Facebook stock, for about right. a year. I have 10 shares. Should I get rid of it or should I sell it? No, no, you're going to hold it because it's not expensive, believe it or not. Uh, it, it's probably the least expensive of the mega caps you back out what happened at Alphabet. Here's what I would say. I would say that if it went down, let's say, 100 points, you should buy another, another uh, 25. I'm not countenancing selling it right here because there's too much in the pipeline that could be very good. And we're on a down day, and a lot of people freak out on down days. So stay, with, stay the course. How about we go to Bill Massachusetts? Bill. Hi, Jim. How are you today? I am good, Bill. How are you doing? I, I had a question for you. Uh, in this pullback here, there's two stocks here and these two CEOs I absolutely love. And I like your opinion on the sure. two stocks. Uh, compare yeah. them, please. Uh, the first one is Broadcom with Hawk Tan, right. and the second one is AMD with Lisa Sue. Thank They're you. They're very, very tough. You put a gun in my head, it would be so hard. I, and by the way, Hawk is really, they're going to report this weekend. He's remarkable. And you know, I think of Lisa Sue from AMD. She is just terrific. Well, it doesn't have to be either or because the Chapel Trust owns both. Beware Broadcom reports this week. Right now, anything that's reported, it just doesn't seem to matter. It's going to go lower. But, but you know what? In two days, anything can happen. That's how crazy this market is. Look, the AI thesis for buying shares of Dell is alive well. And I'd recommend buying the stock into any additional weakness that it looks like we're going to get from here. Remember, it is September. Now, much more mad money, including my exclusive with Vista Energy. Now, climbing nearly 3,000% since its 2020 lows. Should investors be looking at a foreign oil and gas producer, even though they're giving away a lot of American ones? I'm leaning more and learning more about the CEO and the story. Then some companies just need to clean up their darn balance sheets in order to get back in the good graces of investors. I've got three names where cash could be key to a turnaround. And the oil calls rapid fire in tonight's decision of the lightning round. So stay with Kramer. conundrum here. On daily today, with the price of oil plummeted, right, and the exploration production stocks, they all got slammed. It's worth hunting for bargains in the energy sector, which brings me to Vista Energy. This is an oil and gas producer based in Mexico City, but may, just think Argentina. That's where it operates. These are terrific growth properties that have allowed the stock to surge from $1.80 at the COVID era lows in April of 2020, all the way to $49 now. And that's after a nearly 6% pullback today. Stock's up, get this, 1,800% since the end of 2020. It's up 821% for the end of 2021. And it's actually up 66% year to date. And yet before Vista Energy came to the New York Stock Exchange today to celebrate the fifth anniversary of its NYSC uh, listing in 2019, I'm embarrassed to say I'd never heard of the thing. That changes tonight. Well, I'm a big gardener about any company that operates in Argentina because it's got rampant inflation there. Clearly, these guys are doing something right. So let's check in with Miguel Galuccio. He's the founder, chairman, and CEO of Vista Energy. To learn more, Mr. Galuccio, welcome to Mad Money. Hi, Gene. Thank you Good for coming you. here. All right, now I have to tell you, sir, because uh, I'm down here for the morning show, and I said to my colleague, Ben Stoto, who's our research director, like, 
Who are these guys? And then we look at the chart and we see it's monumental. So why don't you give us the backstory here? Because and, and people should know you are a seasoned person when it comes to the oil business. Yes, yeah, Jim. Well, so yes, I am a seasoned person. I've been working in the new industry for a long time internationally. I went back to Argentina in 2012 uh, because I thought it was time to come back to a company that I passed through that was YPF. At that time, Argentina was starving for energy. Right. We were importing $10 billion of energy in the country. And, uh, and what came across to us, there was an opportunity to develop unconventional resources. We will start to do. Today, fast forward, uh, Baca Muerta, that is the resource play that we have there. What's the translation for that? Baca Muerta is dead cow. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, I'm sorry. Dead cow. And there's many stories about why we <laughs> and you're gonna it give it to, And you're going to give it to us, but yeah. go ahead. But, uh, Baca Morta represents 50% of the production of the country, and Argentina has become a neck exporter. So we export around 180,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, well, after that and why I'm here, I create Vista with uh, a group of very good seasoned people. Uh, we listed in the stock exchange in uh, 2019. As you said, at nine dollars, today we are trading close to 50 have been a fantastic ride. Yeah. Uh, production have tripled, uh, reserve have sectuple, and uh, EBITDA went from $150 million, and we are aiming to $1.1 billion this year. So we have a very good ride. And you have gigantic reserves. We have gigantic reserves. The country have gigantic reserves. This is, uh, there's no an analog in U.S. of the rock that we have there. Uh, we believe it's a com- side of the best of the U.S. Uh, and yes, we have a uh, reserve replacement ratio of 400 percent for the last four consecutive years. So this is a growth story uh, and will continue to be a growth story uh, the time to come. We have a lot of coverage, uh, 30 analysts cover us. Uh, the consensus for end of 2025 is around seventy-two dollars, right, and they all were incredibly complimentary during the conference call. They all congratulated you, and it is without a doubt a, a considered to be a pristine story. Now you worked at YPF, you worked at SLB, formerly Schlumberger, so you can tell us this question: Why is, should we invest in Argentina when we hear about all this rampant inflation and companies getting out of Argentina? Well. Uh, if you look at it 2012, when we decide as a country that uh, we want to have energy security, that means that we cannot depend from abroad. And what has happened since then uh, up to here uh, is a very consistent story. We went through three different governments and we have to bring the equipment. Uh, we have to build infrastructure. Uh, we have to repatriate people. And we have to bring investors. So most of the international oil companies today are present in Baca Muerta. Uh, we have a law that regulates what we do. Uh, it's a good law. And with this new government also, we have some changes on the regulations that are toward to more a free market. So I think when you look at the story for the last uh, 12 years, it's a good story. And independently. That right, we now, independently also, now trade. you do a lot of your business in dollars. Yes. So we're not sitting here in the moment we buy it and Argentina devalues, we get hurt, right? That does not happen. No, our balance sheet, top line and bottom line, uh, they are completely sync. So we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, any kind of reason on, on, on effects, not okay. big reason effect. Okay, so uh, Va- Vaca Muerta, uh, you said it's unconventional. So it really is kind of like Permian, but you don't want to really give me that analogy, huh? It's better? No, it's better. It is. I think it's better. Now, that's we a have, tall order to be better than the Permian. Well, we have better pressure. Uh, that is important. We have more net pay. That means we have more layers and right. more meters uh, to develop. We have very good organic content. So uh, when you look at the boss, I will say uh, we have a better rock. Uh, now, uh, one last question. Uh, oil itself. Maybe you can give us your take. It's $70. Can it hold this level? I know it's hard to predict, but you probably, you've been a person who really understands oil from every single side. Is this the beginning of some big decline? I don't think so, Jim. I mean, we have long-term view on oil. 
so we don't move our plans or our capital right. expenditure on the sentiment. This week, we have a negative sentiment. Okay. Or you guys have a negative yeah. sentiment. We look at the long term. And long term, what I believe is uh, that the demand on energy will outpace uh, the offer of energy in general. And I'm not talking about oil and gas. Right. Uh, we believe in 2050, uh, the energy consumption is going to double. And we oh, don't see okay. how mathematically oil and gas can be replaced that fast. Uh, so therefore, we do believe, uh, we do our plans with 60, $65, $70, right. but we really believe that the oil price for the medium and long run will be between $70 and $80 and per and barrel. And the company makes an immense amount of money at those prices. If anyone looks at the conference calls, they'll know you're maybe the most profitable of almost every oil company in the world. We are very profitable. Very yeah, we yeah. have 65% margins of EBITDA. Uh, yes, uh, we probably have not the full upside, zip, the zip code of Argentina right. yet. Uh, EBITDA multiples are around four today. Right. Uh, but Argentina, I'm confident in Argentina, we should improve. That also oh. should help to our stock. Excellent. Well, you're a delight. I'm so glad you rang the bell. I would not have heard you otherwise. So it is good to have that publicity. And I've got to tell you, you've done a remarkable job and, you know, Herculean job because it seems odd that you go to Argentina and get everything going for you. But you have done that, Miguel Galuccio, founder, chairman and CEO of Vista Energy, V-I-S-T. If you're as interested in it as I was, read the conference call. You will not believe how positive analysts are about this one. Their money's back after the break. Coming up, hit us with your best shot. An electrified fast fire lightning round is next. It is time. It's like a white man. Good man, but it's from Wamra. Cold Lane, Tim, the stock is set up. Bye bye bye. Sells the sun just third. Now the core stock right there. My step first. We have some fight. Play the sound. And then the lightning round is over. Are you ready? Ski, that time for the lightning round. Chris, let's go with Bob in California. Bob. Bob, how are you doing, uh, Jim? This is uh, Bob in Northern California. Bob, how are you? I'm a club member, first time in the cruiser. I'd like to invite your Eagles to the playoff game in January against their 49ers. Done. I'll accept the invitation. How can I help? <laughs> PRCT, it's a robotic. Uh, it's been a rock. It's been a rocket, but I think if you're going to be in robotics, you got to be in ISRG. That's a safe improvement one we have on the show, and I really like them. Let's go to Brian in Florida. Brian. Hey Jim, thank you so much for taking my call. I'm a of big fan of yours. We've, we've spoken you. many times throughout the years, everything from Bar San Miguel to Mensa, speaking French and Gateau. And I need your advice with two things. Uh, while I love your stock advice, I also truly appreciate your football wisdom. So, two questions for you. What do you think of the stock Zoetis? And other than the Chiefs, who do you think are going to be some surprise division winners? Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, I like Zoetis very much, and we recently had Christian Peck on. She did a great job, great spokesperson for it. And I think the surprise might be the Jets. Uh, I'm not kidding. I think the Jets have a, a quarterback who can be very good if he stays healthy. I think that Brees Hall is unbelievable, and I like the receiving core. And the defense, I think, is the best in the NFL. Let's go to Trey in Texas. Trey. Jim, while I was working like a dog today, my wife was getting her colors done. If you don't know what that means, it's where you pay a fraud to basically hold a paint swatch in front of you and tell you what colors you look good in. Look out, tarot card readers. Morally reprehensible and quite expensive, I'm trying to get us back on track financially by picking up a multi-bagger and a lot of instant ramen. Could Target be my one-stop shop for both? Uh, I don't know if it can do all that for you, but it does yield 3%, which is actually quite good, and it had a very, very good quarter, and I appreciate the humor. A very, very tough day. Let's go to Arthur in New York, please. Arthur. Hi, good evening, Professor Kramer. I love How your you? show and been watching since day one. Thank you very much. My question is, um, with bond yields, particularly in the Treasury market on the short end at around 5 and the 10-year running at maybe 383. What say you on my stock, Con Edison, ED? I like Con Ed for, I don't know, maybe 70 points. It's got a great yield, and I think at this point, you know, it's still, as long as it's around above three, I think the stock can still project itself even higher. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion of the Lightning Round. The Lightning Round is sponsored by Charles Schwab. 
Coming up, CPAC's in an upright position. Kramer reveals item one on Boeing's to-do list. Next. First thing you do, you fix the balance sheet. That's job one in any turnaround. It needs to be done swiftly because there can be no room for doubt that you've got enough cash if you want potential investors to buy your stock. I bring this up because the new CEO of Boeing, Kelly Ortberg, has a chance to raise equity here before the company's cash flow peaks in 2027. And that's the gist of an excellent piece by Wells Fargo's Matthew Akers, where he dares to tell the truth about how much trouble Boeing will be in if it doesn't raise some cash. Under a bullet in the piece entitled Cash Risk, Akers writes, and I quote, In the coming year, Boeing must deal with upcoming union negotiations, contract end September 12, planned integration of Spirit Aerosystems, which burned $1 billion in cash on its own in the first half, softening airline yields, which could impact orders, continued FAA pressure, and recent 777X and Starliner technical issues, which could add to program costs. End quote. Given that litany of woes, it's clear Boeing desperately needs to find a way to cut down on the $45 billion in net debt on its balance sheet. Right now, Wells Fargo estimates that it's taking care of the debt, quote, we consume all Boeing's free cash flow through 2030, end quote. Most important, Acres says, quote, we doubt it can kick off a new aircraft program, $40 billion plus investment, without first cleaning up its balance sheet, end quote. There it is, a stark contrast to the views of so many people who believe that everything's fine at Boeing. You raise the capital, you address that balance sheet directly, and that's how Boeing can bring in serious buyers. Given that there are only two players of consequence in this business, Airbus and Boeing, there's always going to be faith that things can work out. But right now, that's all based on hope. And as I tell club members in the investing club, hope is not a strategy. Hence, the stock's $12 decline, or 7.32%. Boeing's not alone. There's another Dow Jones stock that could use a little capital, Intel. Last month, Bank of America Securities downgraded from hold to sell, with analyst Vivek Arya noting that Intel's repeatedly missed its estimates while guiding for its gross margins to come in near historical lows. End quote. That's because Intel is the wrong mix and has shifted to higher cost manufacturing. In fact, this data center business is down 3%. Difficult to fathom given the strength in that. Arya explains that Intel, quote, is just not equipped to simultaneously compete against focused and agile fabulous NVIDIA and AMD and foundry Taiwan semi rivals, end quote. He says that Intel's hemorrhaging market share, and that's going to hurt them long term. Of course, CEO Pat Gelsey continues to talk a big game. In a recent fireside chat with Deutsche Bank, he opined about how his turnaround's in phase two. But at the same moment, he says that Intel can see the finish line in sight of phase one, which is the rebuilding of the company and, quote, being able to get back to process and product leadership. Huh? What, what, which phase are they in? What, what leadership? That belongs to AMD for PC and server technology and NVIDIA for artificial intelligence. Kelsey is always talking about cutting costs. And, you know, Kelsey, he always talk, he, it's just he just prattles about the stuff. And he's now eliminated the dividend as well. But I have to ask, why isn't anyone talking about that Intel $53 billion debt load and how he's going to pay for it? The rumor now is that he wants to sell Altera. The vision he's run down to Marvel Technologies. Maybe he will. But whatever he, he, he's got to do, he's got to do it now. And let's add Walgreens to the list. This giant pharmacy chain has seen its stock go down and down and down. Some were maybe, maybe uh, because of its debt burden. For, fortunately, Walgreens has some assets it can sell. Unfortunately, if it doesn't sell them quickly, I fear things will get worse before they get better. I think the situation is so murky because Walgreens need to refinance billions of dollars at rather high rates. And all of the sale leaseback deals these guys did in order to raise money will only complicate things further. They sold the land under many of their stores, and now they're renting. The simple truth is that Walgreens must raise capital. The stock buyers will remain on strike. Two Dow Jones stocks and one former Dow Jones stock, all in pretty weak shape. Something that can be cured only by raising money to fix their balance sheets. Until they do so, I say stay away. I like to say there's always bull market summer, and I promise to try to find it just for you right here on Mad Money. I'm Jim Cramer. See you tomorrow. All opinions expressed by Jim Cramer on this podcast are solely Cramer's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of CNBC, NBC Universal, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated by Cramer on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Jim Cramer as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. Cramer's opinions are based upon information he considers reliable, but neither CNBC nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warn its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. To view the full Mad Money Disclaimer, please visit cnbc.com forward slash Mad Money Disclaimer.